So I wrote Age of Context, which is about how contextual computing is changing our lives. Uh, and today I'm happy to have MindMeld here, who has built a contextual search engine that you can talk to. And now they're uh, releasing, well, I'll let you t let them tell you the news, but there's some news here. And uh, MindMeld is right now on the iPad. So who are you? Uh, my name is Tim Tuttle. I'm the CEO and founder of Expect Labs. Expect Labs is the creator of this uh, iPad app called MindMeld, and we're also the creator of a brand new developer platform that we call the MindMeld API that we uh, are just launching right now. And that's that's the news. That's the news. We're launching it. Uh, it's available for developers to begin um, using to build contextually powered search applications today for free. You can sign up at developer.expectlabs.com and get, get using it today. So a lot of people probably haven't seen uh, MindMeld. I think it's a $4 app in the App Store, right? So. Yeah. So, um, so you're not flappy birds, right? <laughs> so, uh, so what our what our company is doing? We um, we were founded uh, a few years ago specifically to build what we thought was a better search engine that's driven by context, not keywords. Yeah. And this is the the new frontier of content discovery, as you know. Um, your book is all about this. And what we realized back then is that the technology required to power these search engines is very different. So we wanted to do a couple things. We wanted to build a technology platform. And as a way to show people how it could work, we built this iPad app called MindMeld. And that's really just a showcase for this larger platform that we hope can power lots of different applications. So uh, before we see it, um, why do I need a contextual search engine? What, why, why can't I just use Google Now or, yeah. or Bing or <laughs> one of the other search engines? Or Yeah, well, yeah. so um, there's a, a lot of companies, a lot of app developers that need want to have better search, better recommendations inside their applications. And in today's world where we're using dozens of different devices, <clears throat> um, many of these devices don't have keyboards, and when we want information, we're not necessarily at our desk. The only good way to do that is by using these contextual signals, using signals maybe from voice or by paying attention to where a user is or what they're doing in the app. And that product, which you could call contextually driven search, doesn't, doesn't exist. It's not, there is no platform available to do this for developers. Yeah. You can't use Google Now to do it, you can't use Bing, those, those are consumer products. Or Siri, I you guess. You can't use Siri to do this. Yeah. And so um, you know, what we have is the first cloud-based service and developer platform that lets developers build that type of fun functionality in their app and do it very easily because it's a simple cloud-based service and all the hard work is done. For what, uh, and maybe you can show us this, but what kinds of things work really well in MindMeld? What, you know, what, what kinds of affordances does it have? And where does it not work? You know, where, where would I still need to go back to Google or Bing yeah. to, to use traditional search? Well so, the, um, well, so there's the MindMeld app that we have, and that's designed to be a consumer voice-driven app. So it's kind of like a version of Siri where you can talk for as long as you want, and then it will continuously show you information. And that works, you know, that works well for, it's a general, general knowledge consumer app, so you can ask it about things like current events and um, local businesses, stuff like that. But where most of our customers um, are using the MindMeld platform, this MindMeld API, is for things, for different applications that are not necessarily general knowledge. Most of the applications we're working on aren't voice driven. They're driven yeah. by other contextual streams like, you know, the, the things that a user is writing or the things that a user is reading in your application. And most of them typically allow the user to search across content that's not, you know, from the web, but it's maybe from their own website or their own database or their own SharePoint server or something like that. So yeah. the range of applications is wide. So, the, and this is the, my, my best friend is creating a platform company too, and he, he worked at Apple on dashboard and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, it's really hard to explain what a platform yeah. does, because uh, <laughs> what, what's a platform? You know, like, like the iPhone's a platform. Well, well what, is, what does it do? Oh, it makes phone calls. Well, and, and you can do Instagram. What's Instagram? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it's hard. So, so that's why exactly why we build the MindMeld app is to show people an example of one application that was built on this platform. But what the platform is, is, a, is it's a cloud-based service and a set, of, a set of developer libraries that make it really easy to build this 
you know, Google Now or Siri type search functionality into your app. Can you actually have a conversation with it? I mean, I, that's where we're heading, really, is uh, to be able to have the uh, her kind of, yeah. you know, this movie came out called Her, yes. where the guy is having this conversation <laughs> and love affair with his computer. Uh, it's not that good yet, but, no, it's not, it's but not, we're heading that we're way. We're definitely more. heading there. Um, if you look at where the technology is today compared to what's two years ago, it is significantly better. Um, and so we're moving towards this world where the com your computing device, your application is going to pay attention to the things that you say, but not only that, it's going to pay attention to the things that you write, the things that you're reading. It'll know the same things you know, and that will make it much better at fi answering your questions, finding the right information for you when you need it. So on, that, the, yeah. on the back end, do you have as many pages as, you know, it, it used to be when Google and Al AltaVista and Yahoo were going at it in search, they would all brag at how many pages they were indexing, right? Do, yeah. do you search the entire world of the web out there? Yeah, so that's not what, so that's not what our platform um, is designed to do. We're not trying to search the entire web. What we're trying to do is for our, our given customer that might have their own collection of documents or their own collection of web pages or might have their own website, we want to do a really good job analyzing, indexing, and modeling that content so that we understand the, um, the semantics of it, understand yeah. the meaning of that content so that you can then use these contextual signals could, to let users discover it. So this platform, could it be used by like a Netflix to build a new kind of search engine yeah, for a, movies or yeah, something? Yeah, that's a very good example, right? If Netflix wanted to create the, you know, a Siri-like all-knowing intelligent assistant that was really smart about the, just their content and knew all about the names of the movies, the names of the actors, our platform would be a very good option to do that. It would make it much easier for them to build something like that. And it probably would be good for a Foursquare because of the same reason, right? Right, right. So, it, so any app developer, you want to talk to app developers and make, probably, I, I'm guessing, OEMs, like, yeah. I, I assume you wouldn't mind being put into a Ford car or something like that, right? Right, so this is exactly right. So like, there's this, you know, the applications that our customers are building right now r really range from consumer, you know, consumer apps to heavy duty enterprise applications. And I'll just give you a couple examples, right? So there's obviously things like um, having a better, you know, let's say video, video discovery app using contextual signals like voice. That's an, an obvious application where, you know, if you have an intelligent system that understands video and video content, actors much better, that's great. There's, um, we're working with big enterprises who operate these dashboards for knowledge workers. Maybe you can think of like sales support or call center applications. Yeah. And what they really want to do is make it so that these call center reps just by interacting, watching what they do and listening to the things they say, and now that listening to the things that the customer is saying, maybe when they're on the phone with them, they can do a better job you know, connecting the, the, the customer with the right product. That's a very common application that our customers are using. And then there's um, you know, websites like blogs or um, content websites that just want to have modern contextually driven search. Right? They want Google Now style search as opposed to the old style type of keyword search. Yeah. Right? So the ones that are on the cutting edge are looking at ways to do that. Because if you have a mobile device or Google Glasses, it's very hard to type a search in this. That, uh, help me understand the difference between a Google style engine, which is sort of trying to become contextual, right, or semantic, uh, compared to a true contextual engine like what you're doing. What, what, what's the technical difference, and where would I where would I see that difference as a platform owner? It, where what could I do with this? Yeah, yeah, so I think it's really in the way, in the Because like when Google came out, it, it was based on links. And so the, there was no porn, there was no spam, because right. it was based on popularity, right? That was the, the page rank algorithm, right? right? And that was a huge step forward. It, it sounds like you're trying to b bring that same kind of step forward to search that, that over the other guys. So. Yeah, so the, so the big transition that's happening in search and content discovery is really moving away from the input being search keyword that you type into a box to being something more passive, continuous, and ambient, where the inputs are the, come from the sensor signals and all the mobile devices that you use. And that could be voice, it could be location, or it could just be this usage pattern of all the things, all the information that you, you're consuming. Or it could be who you're with. It could be related to are you at work or are you at home? You know, are you currently walking, you're driving? Um, what device are you using? Yeah. And that's, that's the difference. And if you, if you look at the back-end architecture, that's a much harder problem to solve. 
because the inputs aren't coming in the form of a word that's very explicit that you then have to match up using statistical text matching methods instead. The so if your engine knows that I'm in a business meeting, it probably is going to give me quite different answers than if I'm running a marathon. I hope it does. And, and, <laughs> and our developers can set it up to, to do that explicitly, right? Our developer platform makes it so that you can adjust these things. Um, so you can see where this world is going. We're going to have the computers in our car where we talk to, you know, yeah. find me a restaurant or a gas station, yeah. right? And it needs to understand that. And there'll be one at home, one in the office. Well, we'll be wearing a watch, wear like an Apple iWatch this year, yeah. and we want to talk to it and say, hey, uh, you know, where should I go for dinner right now? Yeah. Or, or my friend's meeting me at Absinthe, and what else, what's there? You yeah. know, what should we be prepared for? Yeah. Um, that's going to be a different kind of thing than the car or... Right. Yeah. Are you th are you thinking about that world where you're gonna your engine is gonna be put in all these different well, so kinds of? I think the way that it's, you're gonna start seeing this technology show up first is within applications that you already use, right? So, you'll like be the using, Foursquare, the Netflix, right? So you'll be using your set top box or your you know and trying to find uh, you know a video from, you know, on YouTube, and all of a sudden there's this the results that you're getting. You can use a combination of voice if you want to, or you can start typing things in, but it'll also have you know, maybe seeing what you've um, typed in before. It'll know from what you were, you know, searching for, what you were looking for at work, the, the news articles that you read, and it will be able to incorporate that. Is the back end of your engine really good at dealing with uh, changing, rapidly changing data, yeah. like a Twitter firehose, for instance? Because Twitter firehose, during the Super Bowl, there was millions of tweets being thrown around, and yeah. I, I would have liked a search engine to, to refactor the, what people are talking about. Show me everybody with a cloud score of 80, who uh, is talking about the Seattle Seahawks uh, screwing up right now, right, or something like that? Yeah. So the, the we haven't tried to plug in the Twitter firehose, but the, our system is designed to let our customers plug in these continuous streams of data. We call them, you know, these continual context streams. And we have some very large customers that are doing with 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 lots of data at a time. I mean, data that could come from speech to text output from a speech recognizer, right? From, you know, the MindMeld app tries to do this for eight people talking at the same time and analyzing all that text continuously. So that's, it's designed to do that. Um, and we have some large customers that are doing it, but the thing is a customer can decide how much data they want to feed in. If a, a customer wanted to feed in the entire Twitter fire hose, we'd probably have to add some more servers. How, how do you price it out? And is there different pricing for like a, a, a Netflix style uh, app model versus like if Rackspace wanted to put it on the corporate homepage uh, yeah. compared to like a OEM oh yeah, like a Samsung who wants to put it on a watch or something like that. Yeah, so the pricing, so for developers and for people that are just getting started want to play around with it, build some test apps, it's free. Um, so they can use it up into a certain number of search requests per month and what we call contextual uploads, which is the number of chunks of context information they send us to analyze, right? Those are the metrics. And then the pricing goes up from there to be, you know, anywhere from, you know, 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month, uh, you know, depending on how much traffic they drive, how many, um, how many documents we index, how many up contextual uploads we need to analyze, the number of search requests. And then, of course, for very large customers, we have custom plans that, um, where you know, the cost is based on the amount of traffic and the volume of data that we need to analyze. Very cool. Can we see uh, MindMeld? Because yeah. uh, yeah. it, it's a, quite a unique experience. It's very different than using yes. Google. <clears throat> so MindMeld is the, is the first app that we built on this platform. And yeah. we built it because we found that we, it was really hard for um, us to explain to people what contextual search is. And so we built this app that shows them. And when you fire up MindMeld, what it shows you are all the conversations that people are having in MindMeld right now. You can join one of those, or you could start a new one, which I'll do right now. And a conversation is, um, it's kind of like a Skype call, or essentially a, um, a conversation you have with up to eight people at a time. It can be private, it can be public, it could be open to just your friends. I'll make this friends private. only on friends. Facebook. So right. you, Friend, you Facebook friends. Right? Yeah. So if you want, you can invite people to join you, and then we'll try to pull in information from their social graph to understand the context better. But you yeah. don't have to do that. Um, and then as you talk in the conversation, the application will try to understand the things that you say and show you related information. So no, it's not listening right now. No, right? So you have to. So in order to get it to listen, you have to be explicit. You either have to press this button or say, "Okay, mind meld." And then it hopefully we'll start listening like it is now. So I was watching the Winter Olympics. Uh, they had the opening ceremonies in Russia. 
on Friday. I thought the opening ceremonies were spectacular. Um, I know that the downhill skiing event happened uh, on Sunday. And I think the American favorite was Bodie Miller. He was the American downhill skiing champion. I don't think he won a medal. Yeah, you said the course was dangerous. Oh, right, the course was dangerous. So you can see as we're talking, it's trying to understand the things we're saying and then trying to show information that it's relevant. Um, now, on the left-hand side, what the application is trying to do is show what it believes are the key concepts from the conversation. You know, it, it, just like most speech recognition engines, it tries to get it right, and sometimes it misses. If it doesn't, you know, if it misses something, what you'll see is that it, it'll ignore, it'll delete the things that it doesn't think are important to the conversation to show you only the most relevant stuff. And if you want more information about AM, like you want to see information about the opening ceremonies at the Olympics, you can tap on any of these items, you can drill down and get more specific information, right? Um, now, is it trained to your voice or, or could I speak as well? Yeah, so this is, it's trained to my voice and it's the way this is designed to work um, is, you know, one person per iPad. The speech recognition engines that we use are like, they're designed to, to be adaptive. So the accuracy gets better if they know who the user is. So this app doesn't work very well. There's a bunch of people talking in a room, but as you know from probably using Siri or Google Voice Search, if it's just you and you're speaking clearly, it, the accuracy can get pretty good. Yeah. Um, and so that's the same with this app. Um, uh, can you type into it as well? Yeah, or? so you can, if you want to enter something explicitly, you can sort of pull down this thing and enter a search for, you know. Oops. Like downhill danger or something. I know. I'm not sure. Right, you can type something explicitly. It's kind of like doing an explicit search for something. Yeah. And then it'll go off and try to find, you know, relevant information and show you stuff that's related to that. Um, yeah. It didn't remember the context of your other speeches. It, it will try own. to, and the platform that we have does this. I think for this app, since we use it a lot for demos, we've tuned it to be very explicit about what you just typed. Yeah. Um, um, and so let's do another example, right? So the types of information that shows you, right, you can see it's like, it'll show you current events, things like news articles, it'll get you information on Wikipedia. It can also get you information about, I don't know, restaurants. So I was supposed to meet a friend of mine at the Comstock Saloon it's a really good restaurant in downtown San Francisco. Um, they have really good cocktails at the Comstock Saloon. The bartender's really good. And so you can see it's trying to pull up the right information. It's pulling up a Yelp review. It's pulling up a map for the Comstock Saloon. It'll show me the menu. And so the idea here is that, um, you know, the idea is that without even typing a search, it can get you the right information. Yeah. Right? So, and you can tap and drill down and get that information. And on, a, on devices where, um, and devices where you don't have a keyboard and you may not be sitting at your desk, it may be difficult to actually get the information. Um, no, this is killer. I, I'm thinking about how to use this on a watch or right. on a Google Glass, right. you know, and, okay. and Google Glass is okay, but you have to say, okay, Glass, right. Google, and then you do the keyword search. Yeah. This would just be listing and bringing yeah. information into my eye would, yeah. be, would be very useful. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, if, you, if you test this out, you can see wh what this technology is possible, has the potential of doing. And, um, you know, and I know that, you know, this app is not perfect right now, yeah. but there are times when it works so good, you think you want to have it around all the time. And I, you know, I can already see the technology arc on this, right? I, I think the future you're describing where your devices are getting you the information just by paying attention, right? Your flat screen at your house, your Google Glass, uh, that's not that far away. Yeah. And if you use this, I think you can start seeing it. How much, so this app is a demo of the platform. How much of the platform is this actually using? So this is using um, everything in the platform. The, the, the thing that's not in the platform is the UI, but we have, for example, um, a job, uh, iOS client that um, it, that you can that doesn't include the UI, but includes all the hooks to plug into our backend data. And so, a developer, if they want to build an app like this, the hope is that it could be pretty easy. If they have a designer that wants to create a front end, so there's an Objective C library or Objective something. Objective C library that they can drop into their Xcode file and start building apps like this very quickly. Um, I think for simple apps, you can you can be up and running in you know 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, 
If you want to build something more advanced, that's something like MindMel that mixes voice and location and touch, all the tools are there to do that. Yeah. And so we're hoping that developers build a better version of MindMeld um, wow. with our platform. I, I assume that in the next 18 months, Google is going to come out with a contextual operating system, one that's going to know whether you're running, walking, shopping, driving, in a meeting, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And it's going to report that stuff up to the apps. Is your uh, platform ready to take those contextual signals in as as new uh, contextual signals that you could use to refactor the searches? Yeah, so it is. I would say we're not, we're not since those signals aren't widely used now, we're not, we yeah. haven't optimized our, our classifiers, our algorithms to, yeah, I think to do Google a good job has, with them. Yeah. Google has an API that knows you're walking, r running, biking, and driving yeah. right now. And these for are getting content. baked into the chipsets, right? Yeah. So Qualcomm, Intel are actually taking some, well, maybe not those, but but they're actually uh, Qualcomm is with right, gimbals right, with the exactly. gimbal uh, uh, contextual yeah, right. Uh, SDK, right? But th it's in early days, yeah, and, and this field is going to rapidly evolve. I think over the next uh, a year to two yeah, years. Right? I mean, every every six months that goes by, there's new contextual signals that you can take advantage of. Right, the, the ones that I'm excited about. There's all these ones that come with wearables. And you talk about, you know, Google just acquired Nest, and you think of your home full of all these devices that are capable of picking up on you know who's in who's in the house what are they talking about what are they doing you know when did they arrive yep. all right these are all very they can be very helpful signals at allowing the applications that you use to be as knowledgeable as a person is in answering your questions and finding information you need wow right? that's that's where everyone's going with this and it's really exciting Tell me about your company. How, how is it funded, uh, and how many people work there? And stuff yeah. Like that. So we're um, so we were uh, founded in 2011. For the first two years, we were building out this platform. It's mostly a bunch of technical folks who have you know backgrounds and things like machine learning. Most of them are Stanford PhDs, MIT PhDs. My background is also academic. I was at MIT for a long time. Got my PhD at the AI lab. Um, uh, but since then, I've started a couple other companies, and this is my third company that I've started. Um, we spent the first year and a half building out the core platform. Starting last year, we started showing, uh, talking a little bit what we were doing. We created this MindMeld app and started showing that off a little bit. From that, got a lot of interest from some very large technology companies um, who were, uh, who were, we were fortunate enough to have them invest in the company. So our backers include Google and Samsung and Intel. And Telefonica, and this company, Liberty Global, large, uh, lar largest cable company outside the U.S. Yeah. Um, and so we have great backers. This is a very strategic area for them, and so we have great support. Um, we are uh, a little less than 15 people right now, so we're still small, but we're just getting to the product of the market. We have some uh, awesome early customers who we've been working with for the past several months. We have very good um, growing revenue. Um, and so I think this opportunity is, um, well, this area is huge amount of progress we're gonna see, and I hope that uh, our company can play a big role in that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Where do we learn more about it? So you can try out our new developer platform. You go to developer.expectlabs.com and check it out, and the product is called the MindMeld API. So check it out, try, build, start building applications for free. Very cool. Thanks Great. for coming Thank in and showing to me and talking to me about what you're doing. Great, thank you very much.